Session one of a nine-week course, The Entire Bible for Everybody, from Atheists to Christian Believers, explaining the Bible's message scientifically, including the Bible's role in the history of civilization and its relationship to modern science. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to The Entire Bible for Everybody from Atheists to Christian Believers, and this is Session 1, The Overview. Okay, uh, my name is Pastor Richard Matheson, Interim Master at St. Luke's Lutheran Church on North 7th Street. This is the entire Bible for everybody from Atheists to Christian Believers, Session Number 1. And our subject, of course, is the Holy Bible. And I am going to make several claims here we can discuss. But the Bible is the most influential book in the history of the world. And the Bible changed the course of the history of the world. Now, are those overstatements? Is that just a pastor talking? No. I'm going to claim it's scientifically true. It can be documented. And that claim is accepted by well-informed atheists and agnostics. Now, they would say that it's the most influential for better or for worse, because some of them don't think it was for good. And the church has certainly been involved. I can see people nodding their head. The church has been involved in a lot of things, and some of them, you know, maybe the Crusades or the Inquisition can be uh, liked or not liked. Yeah, the whole history of the human race is actually, we'll find out, very ugly. But, uh, and the church is obviously part of it, but uh, those are the claims that I'm willing to make and willing to defend if you wonder. So, uh, the Bible is the most influential book in the history of the world for better or for worse. It changed the course of the history of the world for better or for worse. That's all. Okay, why should an atheist or skeptic care about the Bible? And the answer is because it's difficult or impossible to understand the modern world, the world we live in, and the history of the world without understanding the Bible, for better or for worse. So what's the Bible about? I will say the Bible answers the two most important questions in life, which are what is the meaning of life and what is human nature. Now, the meaning of life is usually described about human connections to the divine, to God, I'm pointing up here. Whereas, human nature is about human connections to other connections. That's horizontal. And the Bible, I will say, offers a highly sophisticated point of view on both. The meaning of life is about human connections to God. The human nature is about human connections to each other. And the Bible answers these. Although, in the case of what is the meaning of life, there are people such as atheists who say, is there such a thing as the meaning of life? because they may deny that there is such a thing. And what is human nature? There are people, including the social sciences, who deny that there is such a thing as human nature. So we will be discussing those. But throughout all of history, all tra tribes, nations, and empires have been religious, usually very religious. Religion gives meaning to life. But all of those empires and tribes in the ancient world were polytheistic, meaning they believed in multiple gods. And when the Old Testament was written, every culture in the entire world was very religious, and every culture in the entire world was polytheistic, multiple gods. And that's something that's been confirmed by modern archaeology and modern anthropology. So when the Old Testament was written, that was a situation, and the Old Testament was revolutionary because it had this claim of monotheism. 
a highly sophisticated concept of God. And that was truly revolutionary. This was the first time. And if you want to discuss that, true monotheism in the Old Testament. So, and later on, when you get to Christianity, that's even more sophisticated with the concept of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But if anybody says, you know, the Bible is eh, childish, old-fashioned, unsophisticated, I think I will argue they're just wrong. So about human nature, the Bible also offers a highly sophisticated concept that humans are created in the image of God, imago Dei, but humans are seriously flawed. In other words, we are capable of doing lots and lots of good things, right? Lots of accomplishments. And yet, we have all sorts of ugliness. You can just turn on the TV every night and read about the bombing or the war in Ukraine or people shooting up whole schools, killing them you know that human nature is not anything terribly nice. And the Bible says humans are seriously flawed, and the claim of the Bible, I will argue, is the flaw is selfishness. And the remedy of the Bible, both the Old Testament and New Testament, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Overcoming that selfishness that is so much a part of us. Now, maybe not all of you are selfish, and I won't say that, but that is, that, you know, that is a constant theme of the Bible. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here. Daddy, why are there no dinosaurs in the Bible? I I got this question actually in Schweiksville. My wife knows we were there two days ago. But, but uh, a man came to me after church and he said, Pastor, why are there no dinosaurs in the Bible? And he said his 10-year-old son came home from school all excited about dinosaurs and asked him, Daddy, why are there no dinosaurs in the Bible? And I said to him, I looked him in the eye and I said, well, what do you think the Lord God Almighty, this is the way I talk, not to you, but what do you think the Lord God Almighty should have said about dinosaurs in the Bible? And he was a little taken aback, and then he, he thought about it just a couple of seconds, and then he cracked up laughing. Because he knew, as well as I knew, that everything we know about dinosaurs came in the last 250 years from fossils. So there is a fossil, that's T-Rex, and they were in the world, according to science, between six, 150 million years ago to 65 million years ago. But it's those bones that are uh, what first told us about it. Anyway, the writers of the Bible 2,000 years ago had no idea, and they didn't care. Their problem in that day was always monotheism and the fight against polytheism in Israel. You know, the worship of Baal, the worship of Astarte, you know, all of the gods of the Canaanites. So anyway, that's dinosaurs. And if you're even humans, you know, we, what we know, that's the fossils of Lucy three million years ago. Somebody put that head on top. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but everything we know is modern. And the Bible didn't know about it and didn't care about it because they're concerned about the relationship to God, monotheism, and to each other. So in the Bible, there are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 for a total. I'll tell you how I remember. The Old Testament. The word old has three letters in it, and Testament has nine, so there's 39 books. And the New Testament, three and nine, but you multiply it. Where is that? There we go. And uh, it's 27 books. And when you add them together, you get 66 books. This is our topic for today. So this will be the big picture, the main message of the Bible, and the way everything fits together 
The God of the Bible is mysterious. I can quote scripture if you want, but that God has chosen to reveal himself in a particular way in the Bible. And I call it that it's like a cosmic drama in three acts, like a play in three acts. Act one, act two, act three. Act one is the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures of Judaism, about ancient Israel and Judaism. That was the first time that God revealed himself. Act two was Jesus of Nazareth and his life, death, and, resur and resurrection, according to Christians, certainly. And, uh, and we can give his dates. We'll talk about that in a second. But that was Act 2. And then Act 3 was the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. In other words, according to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was on the earth from the day of resurrection, Sunday, Easter Sunday, 40 days, then he ascended into heaven, and at 50 days he sent down the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to form the Holy Christian Church. Here is a, that's a painting, you can see if you you can see the tongues of fire, but that was the birthday of the church, of the Christian church. And in my congregation, I sing happy birthday to the church every Pentecost Sunday, because that is the birthday of the church. And that's Act 3. So Act 3, that's a dove over there, if you could is the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and I refer to this by eight words, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. Now I do that because these eight words, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, can be thought of in two different ways, as the visible church, that's the church buildings we have all over the place, Protestant, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and then Protestants, you know, Baptists, Presbyterians, uh, Methodist, Lutheran, you know. and also can be thought of as the invisible church, uh, which is all Christian believers who ever existed going back to the very beginning and, for that matter, forward in time, thinking of them as the church rather than the institution. And I think that's helpful because the institutions have not always been what we would like them to be. I'll just say that, but, uh, but I think of it this way as the invisible church. In other words, from the day of Pentecost uh, for the last, <clears throat> I, I will show you that I believe uh, that uh, the Holy Week occurred in 30 AD. Jesus was born in 4 BC, and Holy Week was 30 AD. And from 30 AD to, 9, for, to 2023 is, and I did the math, 1993 years. But that's been a constant thing where that invisible church has been acting for almost 2,000 years. And you'll see why that matters. Okay, at the center of the Bible is Jesus. And Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus was the most influential person in the history of the entire world. You can see that I'm into this. And Jesus changed the history of the entire world. I expect by the end of today that I will have demonstrated that to you historically. And because of Jesus, the Bible has been the most influential book in the history of the entire world, for better or for worse. And because of Jesus, the Bible changed the history of the entire world, for better or for worse. Are those overstatements? No, I believe they're scientifically true and documented. Okay, now we come to the sheet in front of you. And, uh, I'm going to be talking about it up here, but you may want to follow me. This is a timeline of civilization for Bible purposes. I actually went out, you can see it's copyright 2018. 
uh, I went out and had an artist do this. In fact, I paid her $1,000 for some slides just because I wanted to have this. But you will see that uh, it starts over here at 3000 BC. That's the start of history, the start invention of writing, because history requires writing. Then we go up 3,000 years up to zero, which is the birth of Jesus, about there. And then we go over to 2000 AD, which is today, 2023. So this is the entire history from, you can see up there, 3000 BC to 2000 AD, and, and 5,000 years of human history. We're going to be looking at that because the Bible is, it encompasses most of that. And in the year zero, when Jesus was born, the number of Christian believers was zero. Okay? Before Jesus, there were no Christians. Many members of my congregation just yell it out. Zero. <laughs> but uh, 100 years later, and these are scientific estimates, there were about 8,000 Christian believers. Then we go another, two, another 100 years to 208. The number is up to about 150,000. And finally, in 380, there were about 3 million. This is tremendous growth. And in 300 AD, or shortly thereafter, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, that's when he ruled. And in 313, he legalized Christianity, which had been a forbidden religion. And then, of course, that greatly helped Christianity. So by 400 AD, we're up to 25 million. These are scientific estimates. In fact, the person I'm following happens to be an atheist named Bart Ehrman. He's a very good scholar. And uh, in 391, Theodosius I made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And the significance of that was that then the Roman Empire became monotheistic, no longer polytheistic. And I think you probably all know that it was polytheistic until then. And this scholar, this atheistic scholar, Bart Ehrman, is quoted, he wrote a book, and this is, his comment was, the single greatest cultural transformation in history is the transformation of the Roman Empire from a dominance-oriented empire, and I usually show you the fist, you know, to an empire with an ideology that urged an ethic of love and service and equality. And that's in his book about the triumph of Christianity. When he says triumph, he's not saying he's necessarily happy or he is, that's just a fact. Okay, so those are the, the growth of Christian believers. Here's the figures today. Actually, this is from a year ago, but the uh, world has about uh, 7.6 billion people, and Christianity has about 238, 2.38, 31%, Islam about 25, Hinduism about 15, Buddhism about 5. So those are just showing you that it's a continued process of growth. Okay, now we come to discussion. <clears throat> and you don't have to answer anything, but if you're really, uh, what led you to sign up for the course and what do you hope to learn from the course? Okay, on oh, the rules, here's, here's, we respect all beliefs of all people, all questions are welcome. You cannot offend me or embarrass me. Feel free to toss anything at me that you want. And if you disagree, Ask me to explain. The best thing you can do is say, uh, <clears throat> what is your basis? What is your authority for saying such and such? And I'll tell you. It's either the Bible or it's science or maybe in a few cases it's me. If it's me, I'll be telling you it's me. Okay. Number of Christian believers, the growth. We went through that up to... Uh, 400 AD, now we're going to pick it up at 400. 
What happened in 400 AD, you can see 395 there, uh, was the division of the Roman Empire by the Emperor Theodosius. It had been going on for a while under Constantine, but you can see that the empire was divided into the western half and the eastern Roman Empire. The eastern is known to history as the Byzantine Empire, uh, with its headquarters at Constantinople, named after Constantine. And the Western Empire uh, is at Rome, the head is at Rome, the Vatican, you all know that. And anyway, the Western Empire spoke Latin and the Eastern Empire spoke Greek. And that was part of the, uh, one of the forces that caused the split. And so those two, well you're going to find out, those two halves had very different histories. Christianity in the Roman Empire had enormous influence for over a thousand years. And Western civilization is permeated by Christianity for a thousand years. The Bible was regarded in this whole period as literally true, just like many people today still call, think it's very literally true. And it's a religious heritage of Western civilization. All of Western morality comes out of the Bible. Until recently, and we can talk about that. But, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments are, are the basis of, uh, of Western morality. Okay. And the Eastern half, the Byzantine Empire, endured for over a thousand years from 400 AD. This is driving me. Okay, from 400 AD to 1453 when it was conquered by Muslims. That's that Byzantine Empire. And we're not going to pay a lot of attention to it, although it's interesting, and it's certainly, in my opinion, it's influencing what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. But the Western half of the Roman Empire had a very difficult and different experience. From 400 to 1000 is called the Dark Ages, and then from 1000 to 1600, it's considered the High Middle Ages, the later Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Reformation. And then 1600 to 1800 was the Wars of Religion and the Enlightenment era. And the Wars of Religion were very ugly. I mean, all of history is ugly, if you ask me. But the wars, these were Catholics and Protestants fighting all the way across Europe and killing each other, slaughtering each other, doing horrific things to each other. You know, when I say the church has some unfortunate things in its history, I mean the fact that people who all say they love each other were killing each other for, they, they supposedly killed about 25% of the population of Europe hmm. in the 17th century. Anyway, so, but it was followed by what's called the Enlightenment era, and, okay, here, this is the Dark Ages when the Western Empire was overrun by barbarians from the Germanic tribes, ugly, ugly. And the sack of Rome by the Visigoths. And during the Dark Ages, the Western half of the Roman Empire disintegrated into feudalism and the Germanic polytheistic barbarians were gradually converted to Christianity. And sort of there was a high point, maybe Charlemagne crowned by the Pope, 800 AD. But then the West faced a new group of polytheistic barbarians, the Vikings. And here I may have to take personal responsibility. I'm Norwegian extraction, so I guess this is my ancestors. But uh, in fact, when I uh, taught this once before, somebody said, his wife still thinks he's a barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, knew that was the Vikings. Here's the Vikings. And by the end of the Dark Ages, the Vikings had been converted to Christianity. Then we come to the High Middle Ages. The High Middle Ages were much more positive, but the political structure was fragmented into competing nations. The only unifying factor was the church. And the church was very supportive of science at that point. People are surprised to find that out. But for 600 years, the church was very supportive of science. 
There was enormous progress in science and art, the founding of the great universities, and it led to the Renaissance and Reformation. And here's the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. That's a Gothic cathedral. Uh, the great cathedrals, Gothic architecture. Anyway, the High Middle Ages saw the recovery of Plato and Aristotle and other Greeks, including contribution by Muslim scholars. A lot of uh, the, the Greek knowledge of Aristotle came to the West, not the way you would think it did, you know, from, from the West itself, but through Muslim translations of Aristotle. So many good things happened in the High Middle Ages. That's the Magna Carta in Britain. And uh, Western civilization gave birth to two world-changing inventions, the university and modern experimental science. And here's the universities, the earliest. You go to Google and Google earliest universities, you get this list. Starting in 1088, Bologna. In Italy, you know, England, Spain, France, England, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Italy. The first 10 universities were all in Western Europe, in the Christian countries founded by the Christian church for Christian purposes. But in that period, many bad things happened. There were wars, crusades, plagues, inquisition, and Modern experimental science emerged within these Christian universities. And here are the big names in experimental science. Uh, Roger Bacon in England. Uh, Copernicus, who uh, changed people's views from an Earth-centered universe to a Sun-centered. Uh, Galileo, another famous scientist. And Francis Bacon in England a major figure in that origin of experimental science to do things by testing. And anyway, uh, throughout the high Middle Ages, the later Middle Ages, and the early Renaissance, the church was a supporter of science. Nearly all the scientists were Christians. They saw no conflict in their scientific work with their religion. And the big challenge came much later with the social sciences which had a whole different attitude toward, very negative attitude toward religions. I'm talking about psychology, you know, Freud, sociology, anthropology. Uh, Thomas Kuhn is a famous historian of science, and he says the medieval church uh, from 1000 to 1600 was quite supportive of science. And, but before 1000, the Dark Ages, it wasn't. And after 1600, the church was, for various reasons, anti-science. And of course, that's what the part many people focus on. It was a Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther and other reformers. And it was a revolution, a religious revolution at first, but it became a political revolution. It did result in terrible wars between Protestants and Catholics. And those wars created enormous death and destruction, but it also gave a strong boost to freedom, often inadvertently. And they led to the Enlightenment era in France, Britain, and the US. So the most important period for modern experimental science was, and, and modern religious freedom was this age of enlightenment from 1750 to 1800. These are concepts of freedom and equality, Greek democracy, Roman Republic, Magna Carta, American Declaration of Independence, uh, all men are created, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, the French rights of man. And these are just major points. And I put this onto the uh, timeline of history because you can see that enlightenment period is very, very late. It's very recent. You know, it's only 250 years old or so. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the Statute of Religious Freedom, the U.S. and First Amendment, the French Declaration, Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his Four Freedom Speech in 
1941, that the four freedoms are political freedom, economic freedom, religious freedom, intellectual freedom, all came out of Western Europe and out of this Christian background. And, and uh, well, this is the Iron Curtain. I just showed you that. It's interesting that that division of the Roman Empire to West and East was almost exactly the same as the Iron Curtain. So why am I covering all this history after the Bible was written? I want to demonstrate that Jesus and the Bible changed the course of human history. And it wasn't just back in the first couple centuries. And that the God has continued to work through history in what I call the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, even after the Bible was written. That's my thing. So, oh here, out of an enormous amount of pain and ugliness came the birth of all of our modern freedoms. And I just want to see where I stand. Okay. Oh, this is the Bible's the best-selling book of all times. That's Guinness. Five billion compared to other books. Number of Christian believers. Okay. For a long time, Christianity was pretty much limited to Western Europe and parts of Eastern Europe, and of course the Americas. But the Protestant Reformation led to great strides in having people have Bibles in their own homes and reading the Bible. And again, most of that happened in Western civilization. Today, the Bible has spread far beyond Western civilization and I gave you these numbers, world religions today. Uh, but the Bible is continue, the Bible, Christianity is continuing to grow in the world as a whole. But bad news, even though worldwide the percentage of Christian believers is increasing, in its homeland of Western civilization, the percentage of Christian believers is decreasing, which is interesting. Uh, these are some figures from Christianity. I need to update this. But in the 50s to 70s, somewhere over 90% of people claimed to be Christian, whatever they meant by that. Then in the 90s, it was down to 80%. And uh, today, it's 70% or maybe a little under that. And I like to show what happened. My wife gets a big charge out of this. These are TV shows of the 50s and the 90s. The 50s, uh, Andy Griffith show and Father Knows Best. The 90s, Sex in the City and Friends. And that probably tells you better than anything else the change that has taken place in the United States. The popular TV shows of the early 50s had respect for biblical values, Judeo-Christian. Self-restraint, delayed gratification, willingness to do what's right, values of marriage and family. And of course, in the 90s, that's not a major theme. And self-restraint or delayed gratification or even marriage and the family. Okay, discussion period. <clears throat> 